morning, everyone. Welcome to the final day of the 32nd edition of Soup and Science. My name is Preeti and I'm one of the organizers, co-organizers for Soup and Science. Before we begin, we acknowledge that McGill University is on land which long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples, including the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee nations. We acknowledge and thank the diverse indigenous people whose footsteps have marked this territory on which peoples of the world now gather. I will pass the microphone over to our Associate Dean of Research, John Sticks. Thank you very much, Pretty, and welcome everybody. It's great to see everybody here today for uh, uh, the last day this week of Soup and Science. So um, we are very happy to welcome five speakers uh, with us uh, today, four professors and one student, and I will introduce them in just a minute. Uh, once the presentations are finished in about a half hour or so, uh, you, the students, will have the opportunity to answer a skill testing question about each presentation. And the top 10 students who answer the questions correctly in the fastest time will win a prize. And the prize is $25 credit on your student card toward the purchase of a meal at any on-campus dining location. And then what we're gonna do after that, after, the, after your exam, we're going to have a moderated question and answer session, which will occur in breakout rooms with one speaker uh, and one moderator in each breakout room. And you'll be able to choose which rooms you wanna visit and join the breakout room on your own. So you can pop in from one to another as you wish. And just before noon, we'll come back to the main session and we'll say our thank yous and goodbyes. Wonderful. Okay, so let's get going. Um, I would very much like to introduce our first speaker today, Oana Balmo, and she is in the School of Computer Science. If I'm not mistaken, about, uh, Oana, you have recently arrived at McGill, is that correct? Yes, I, uh, I actually started in January, but uh, recently arrived on campus. <laughs> oh my gosh, so, so welcome, and uh, I'm so glad that you're seeing uh, sort of a real fall of this, 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 com this fall, as opposed to last Janu January. So uh, Oana is, a, uh, is an expert in data storage systems. She's, she knows a lot about memory technologies. And she's also interested in how we manage uh, large-scale data, which is becoming increasingly important. So I'd like to welcome Oana, and uh, over to you, Oana. Thank you, John, for the uh, great introduction. So let me share my screen here. Please let me know if everything is good. Can you, can you see me? Uh, OK, thank you. So like John was saying, I'm interested in um, uh, data management and uh, lar on the large scale. And today I'm going to talk a bit of um, the challenges that uh, are emerging right now in edge computing. So have you, have you ever wondered what happens in an internet minute? Apart from the hundreds of hours of um, video that are uploaded and streamed, thousands of new um, internet of things connections and uh, hundreds of thousands of stories, not even to mention the billions of impressions that are collected for analytics, there's a lot going on. So the first challenge is that we are producing and we will keep producing huge amounts of data that is expected to grow exponentially. In addition to the huge amount of data that we're producing, the way that we're accessing data is also posing uh, a challenge. So uh, the future workloads uh, are going to look a lot uh, like what we have right now in the Internet of Things. This means that we are writing and reading um, data almost in the same, um, the same ratio. So for example, in the Internet of Things, we would read large volumes of sensor data for control and analytics while continuously writing new sensor data. Now, well, what can we do about this? 
cloud computing, which is the traditional way we've been doing computing so far, isn't really suitable for these real-time requirements of, um, of our um, uh, Internet of Things devices because they are far away and also because of the large amounts of data that we produce disposes a big network bandwidth bottleneck. So the solution is to come up with smaller data centers called micro data centers that live on the edge, which are uh, solving the latency and the high bandwidth problem. However, right now, this means that the bottleneck will shift to storage. And this is where my research comes in. So um, the, the news and the third challenge is that uh, the storage hardware has also been changing rapidly. So if uh, maybe uh, 10 years ago, we had main memory and hard disk, Right now, the range of what we can see in storage uh, is uh, much, much higher. So we have uh, things like persistent memory, fast SSDs, flash, in between the two, let's say, more traditional layers. In my lab, which is called uh, Disks, we are looking at how to leverage all of these storage layers inside an edge micro data center to be able to facilitate this real-time computing. And more in particular, the challenge is are real-time communication, huge amounts, uh, dealing with huge amounts of data uh, while extracting insights in real time, and dealing with short-lived data. Now, um, if you'd like to learn more, feel free to uh, check out our website. And um, I also want to tell you that I have open positions at all levels. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Awana. Uh, sign me up. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, Zetabytes. I don't think too often about Zetabytes. That, that was really interesting. Thank you so much. Thank Our next you. speaker. Thank you. Our next speaker is Meta Ben Dixon uh, in the Department of Geography. And Meta is also a recent arrival at uh, McGill. So welcome, uh, Meta. We're very happy to, to have you here with us. Um, uh, Meta is an expert in dynamic uh, landscape processes. Uh, she's interested in, in, in how these impact on the coupled human and natural system. She's particularly interested in Arctic landscape, landscape, landscape changes. And, and also she's very interested in, in, in global sand and gravel resources um, that we maybe don't have enough of. So we're, th we're very happy to have you here at McGill uh, Meta and, uh, and over to you. Thank you very much. Let me just put this one up. Thank you, John, for the introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, as you said, John, I'm in the geography department. I'm trained as a physical geographer. And I'm going to talk to you in the next three minutes about my work on global sand scarcity and how it brings challenges and opportunities to our modern society. So the thing is that a lot of people don't actually know that sand uh, is a crucial material for our modern world. Right now, I'm sitting in a concrete building. Many of you are probably too. We're uh, communicating via computers. And in order for uh, build buildings, we need concrete in many uh, circumstances and you need uh, computer chips for, for our electronic devices. And those things require sand. And just to put it into perspective, uh, between 2011 and 2014, so just three years, China used as much sand as the entire US did the last century. And there is this rule of thumb saying that Western countries need for sand has leveled. Asian countries need for sand is on the rise, but African countries need for sand is not gonna rise until the next 10 years. And right now the African population is around 1 billion people, but by 2050, it's projected to be uh, 2.4 billion people. So with more people on the planet, the need for sand is gonna rise. So what we're interested in is basically understanding this coupled human landscape dynamics of the implication of sand mining. Because the challenge we're seeing already uh, from the impact of sand mining is quite ex uh, extensive and severe. And we know that illegal sand mining has been reported in more than 70 countries worldwide. And in some countries, it's even sand mafias controlling the industry. And that means that we're completely lacking this global overview of where sand is mined from and in what numbers. So one of the projects that we work on and which has a very interdisciplinary approach is to understand how sand mining creates conflicts, uh, but also synergies with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So 
What we're, we've shown in this work is that sand mining actually conflicts with more than half of the UN's SDGs. Uh, we see that it's impacting drinking water, it's impacting in irrigation water and ecosystems and the world's beaches. But on the other hand, we're also seeing that uh, some synergies of sand mining and it's how it's used in the renewable uh, energy transition sector, for example. We also know that it provides job. Uh, jobs for millions of people, and it improves housing, which improves health in low-income countries. So this relationship between sand and our modern world is highly complex. And in my opinion, it's also one of the most overlooked uh, global challenges that we're facing. So I want to talk to you just about uh, a few examples of the work we do. Right now, we have a project uh, focusing on using AI and uh, machine learning to try and automatically detect where sand mining is taking place uh, so that we can obtain this overview we're so badly lacking. And the goal is to map uh, mining activities throughout the entire continent of Africa so that we can predict the future need for sand mining uh, for this essential material. And with this overview, we can link to uh, future urbanization and to health implication that's very tightly uh, linked to sand mining. Just the final project I want to touch upon is how uh, work we do in the Arctic. And it's a project focusing on understanding whether new sources of sand that can contribute to solve the global scarcity of sediment. And we've specifically used remote sensing imagery and historical aerial imagery um, to understand how the melting ice sheet delivers enormous amount of sand to the coast. And this work has really transformed the way we understand Arctic coastal behavior. And what we're doing right now is trying to understand whether the coast of Greenland, or all the sand, uh, could benefit the country by creating uh, or establishing an, uh, an export to the global market. But we're specifically under, uh, interested in understanding the locals' opinion uh, on this uh, relatively controversial uh, subject. So we're conducting a household survey to raise the voices of the local people in Greenland on this uh, potential export revenue. And with that, uh, I want to say thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Meta. That's such an interesting subject. And sand really is a beautiful thing in, in so many ways. It's uh, amazing, amazing material. Um, let's move to our third speaker, Matt Harrington in chemistry. Uh, Matt is uh, uh, an expert in green materials fabrication and uh, he's, he's inspired by nature. And he's very interested in high performance bio polymeric materials and bio inspired materials and bio fabrication, fabrication processes, really amazing stuff. So over to you, Matt. Yeah, just had to unmute myself there. Yeah, thanks. Uh, as, as you said, uh, thank, so first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm uh, from the chemistry department. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can learn from nature about how to make better materials more sustainably. Um, so plastics have great material properties that make them useful for a large range of functions from food packaging to clothing. Um, however, these same properties make them very resistant to degradation. In fact, we have accumulated over 5 billion metric tons of plastics in the environment, and this is projected to increase to about 12 billion metric tons by 2050. And uh, as I mentioned, our group is interested to figure out what nature can teach us about this, because certain organisms like spiders and mussels, and even weird creatures like the velvet worm, create uh, polymeric materials from biomolecular building blocks that have excellent properties comparable to man-made plastics. However, these are produced under ambient conditions and are biodegradable. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, this, the work we do on the mussel byssus. Um, and so these are fibers that the mussels use to attach on surfaces at the seashore. Um, the muscle produces the fibers one at a time using an organ known as the foot, which is this little black tongue-like thing there. Um, and it stores the protein building blocks in small secretory vesicles uh, inside the foot, which are basically tiny protein-filled sacs. And we use a range of advanced methods to understand this process uh, that take advantage of x-rays, electrons, polarized light, and also lasers. 
So um, using electrons, uh, so this is a technique called transmission electron microscopy, we can see that the vesicles, which have this kind of American football shape, uh, show this striped pattern. And these are actually layers of rod-like collagen proteins that are used to make the fibers. Uh, we used a technique called focused ion beam scanning electron microscopy to image the vesicles in three dimensions. So in this technique, you take a picture of the surface of, of a very small sample, and then you cut away one layer at a time with a focused ion beam, and you produce an image stack, a two-dimensional image stack, uh, which you can actually see in this video. This is an image stack um, of, our, um, of our vesicles. And so from this image stack, you can then reconstruct a 3D model of your, uh, of your material. So this is actually a 3D reconstructed chunk of a fish, fit, uh, foot tissue that shows all these little vesicles inside there. Uh, and using this 3D model, we can actually extract out the structure of these small three-dimensional um, vesicles, which you can kind of see here. And if we zoom in on these, we can see these layers. And actually these layers, it turns out, arise from liquid crystalline organization of protein building blocks. And the liquid crystals actually lead to a preferential alignment of the proteins. And we think that this is important for producing fibers that have a high degree of organization and structure. So to test this hypothesis, uh, recently some of the students uh, in the group have been purifying and extracting these, uh, these vesicles. And then they have built a homemade microfluidic device to kind of mimic the muscle byssus formation process and they're actually able to form fibers that have uh, native-like structure and properties. Uh, so we think that these extracted concepts could be useful for making high-performance polymers sustainably at, at some point in the future. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Matt. I mean, that, that's incredibly uh, uh, creative, I thought, and, and your imaging is really, really remar remarkable. Thanks, thanks so much. No problem. Thank our, you. Our, <laughs> that's great. Our fourth speaker is Anna Nijnik in uh, the Department of Physiology. Uh, Anna uh, is an expert in molecular and cell biology. Uh, she's particularly interested in blood and immune cell dif dif differentiation from marrow stem cells. And she's also an expert in immunomodulatory properties of peptides. So Anna, welcome and over to you. Thank you for the uh, for the opportunity to to speak. So, um, we'll all be aware that our body has a variety of different cell types. So, blood cells are completely different from neurons, which are completely different from muscle cells, and so on. But at the same time, most of the cells in our body have the same DNA sequence, and so this leads us to the question: How can one set of genes, limited set of genes, one DNA sequence lead to such variety of different cellular structures and cellular functions. So to understand that question, we need to understand the regulation of gene expression. So we have a model where different genes, uh, different uh, DNA are accessible, in different cell types, different genes are active, and this leads um, to um, allow us the body to, to, to develop a variety of different cells. So how is gene expression? So the fourth to understand control of cell identity and cell differentiation, we need to understand regulation of gene expression. So it's important to remember nuclei of our cells are kind of like uh, balls of noodle, they're full of DNA, and the cell has to work very hard to um, regulate the packaging and the accessibility of that uh, DNA to maintain um, normal function. So, to, so the, the basic unit of uh, DNA packaging within our cells is what we call a nucleosome. So this consists of, uh, in the middle, the proteins called histones. And on the outside, we have the DNA molecule wrapped around uh, these histones. And, uh, and, so, and so there will be, you know, probably millions of, uh, of uh, these nucleosomes uh, uh, within, within our, um, to package all the DNA we have in our cells. 
And so the core of each, as I've already said, the core of each nuclear song consists of uh, histones. There are four different types of histones within, uh, within this structure, and there are two copies of each one, so, so eight histones in total. And um, histones have these tails which protrude out from the structure of the nucleosome and to, to mark uh, uh, different genes for either activation or silencing, the cell attaches different chemical groups to the histone tails. This is called histone post-translation or modification. So uh, genes are intended to be active. There will be one type of type, one set of chemical modifications at the histone tails and at the genes that are silenced, there will be a different set of chemical modifications on the histone tails. And so regulation of this um, histone modification is one of the key mechanisms that cell use to control gene expression. So my uh, research team is interested in the process of, um, through which the body produces blood and immune cells. Uh, so this process is called hematopoiesis, and it involves differentiation of uh, a small population of hematopoietic stem cells that are found in our bone marrow. And uh, these stems differentiate and produce 100 billion different bloods, uh, blood and immune cells every day. And so specifically my research team studies histone modifications and a, a group of proteins called histone deubiquitinases, which are involved in regulating histone modification and therefore regulating gene expression during this process that, <coughs> I'm sorry, allows hematopoietic stem cells to differentiate a variety of different blood cells. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anna, for that uh, really interesting presentation. And we'd like to move on to our last speaker. Last but not least uh, is Anya Mueller. She's a student in biology and she's worked in Jennifer Sunday's lab uh, in biology. So uh, over to you, Anna. Anya, thank you for participating. Need to unmute myself. And um, yeah, okay. So, sweet, okay, it's all loaded. <laughs> all right, well, um, yeah, hello everyone. Um, I'm Anya, I'm a U3, U3 student in biology. And um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the work that I've been doing in the Sunday lab over the last summer and stuff. So um, in order to do that, I need to take you to the ocean. So we're gonna go into the ocean and look at one of the beautiful kelp forests that we have in our coastal waters here in British Columbia and also around the world in other temperate rainforests or temperate uh, coastal waters. And so these are really cool, really important marine ecosystems. And um, unfortunately they have been hit a little bit by uh, climate change and human activity and everything. And so they are declining due to direct harvest, climate change, um, increased human development, and also increased herbivory. And so when we're talking about increased herbivory in um, kelp forest ecosystems, we're talking about the increased herbivory from these little guys, the sea urchins. And these guys normally live in kelp forests, but um, once we uh, get too many of them, then we see the kelp forests uh, go and turn into these urchin barrens. So when there's too many uh, urchins, we see them eating up all the forest and then it, uh, it becomes an urchin barren. So we go from a diverse jungle to an urchin monoculture. And in a normal healthy kelp forest, uh, we have these sea otters, which help to keep the sea urchin populations in check because they love to eat all the sea urchins and they'll keep them, uh, keep, our, keep our system into a kelp forest. But unfortunately, along the coast of British Columbia, there was the fur trade. So we saw a lot of decline in sea otter populations. So many of our kelp forests have been converted into urchin barrens. And so what we're trying to do now is we're trying to restore the kelp. <laughs> so um, logically how we do this is we go in and we remove these grazers. So we can do this by um, bringing back sea otters or going in ourselves and going and taking out the urchins. And, um, but whenever we're doing sort of a project like this where we're trying to 
change something in the environment, we need to make sure that our efforts are not futile <laughs> and that they're, we're succeeding. So um, how do we, oh, sorry. How do we know if our restoration efforts have succeeded? We have to do ecological monitoring. So ecological monitoring is just watching and seeing what species are present. So we look at the species that we had before the restoration and then after the restoration. And we also want to continue monitoring after in a certain amount of time after so that we can see that our efforts were not futile. And so there's multiple ways that we can monitor ecology and uh, ecosystems in the ocean, including um, diving and trawling. But a lot of these uh, methods require taxonomic experts and have heavy field footprints in terms of time and sampling. You have to take like organisms out of the ecosystem, which isn't always the best when we're trying to restore a sensitive ecosystem. So what's really exciting is there's this new method called environmental DNA. And so with environmental DNA, what we do is you can go out and you can take a sample of water and take that sample of water back to the lab and go and take out all the DNA from that sample and figure out which species are present. So it's a really exciting new method that's non-invasive, it's taxonically broad, but there, since it is like a newer method, there are some limitations that we need to um, kind of address and figure out uh, before we start using this like really widespread. So specifically, so that's kind of like what we're doing in our lab is um, one of the projects that we're doing. And what I'm working on is I'm looking at how well does environmental DNA work in monitoring a kelp forest restoration. So um, our kelp forest restoration is here off the coast of British Columbia in Haida Gwaii. And so this is our kelp forest restoration site right here. And this is what we, all the sample sites that we have at the restoration site. And so I am, what I'm trying to do is I'm going to compare the diet, like a traditional dive survey to an environmental DNA survey at the kelp forest, forest restoration site. And then I am going to uh, determine the extent that restoration has occurred in our kelp forest restoration site by comparing the restoration site to the other sites around Haida Gwaii. But um, what I've learned is science takes a long time, <laughs> a lot longer than you expect. So my results are to be determined, <laughs> but I'm happy to answer any questions about the project or about uh, undergraduate research at McGill. Um, yeah, thank you so much for listening.